Good morning, church, and welcome. It's May the 10th, 2020. We're going through COVID-19 and we're locked down. So this is Church at Home from Frodsham King's Church. I've been asked to read some Bible today, but before I read this uh, scripture reading, I want to tell you a story about it. It's so shaming me, is this reading. It's um, about the proud. And um, recently I lost a tooth. It's embarrassing. Embarrassing. Why is it embarrassing to me at my age? One little speck of a thing. There's all my house, there's all my body, there's all my everything. But this one little tooth, I'm worried that people will have a different opinion about me or whatever it is that's craziness and I wondered is that what we like when it comes to speaking about Jesus as well I mean that's just the tooth Jesus is such a great massive thing compared with that anyway that's just my view perhaps we ought to quit with all the pride and whatever and crack on and crack on so being a bit of an evangelistic head on this morning sorry about that I'll continue. I will read from Luke. It's Luke 18, starting at verse 9 onwards. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great self-confidence and scorned everybody else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a dishonest tax collector. The proud Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everybody else down in Hellsby, especially like that tax collector over there at number 42. I don't sin, I don't commit adultery, I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at distance and dare not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, the sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For the proud will be humbled and the humble will be honoured. Praise God. I hope that we can go and tell people about Jesus after hearing that. I certainly will. Um, at the end of the service, there will be a list of social media contacts through Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, phone number, whatever. Get in touch with us. Speak to us. Speak to us about your fears. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a church person, just plug in. Just, just say, yeah, why is this God, dude? Why is this thing that you go to church every Sunday Friday are you still doing that is it still a thing Christianity I mean in going out it's the best feasibility study you'll ever do just have a bash but from me I'll just say have a great week and let's get on with it Oh, 
Friedrich Nietzsche, a philosopher and passionate atheist, uh, said this of Christianity, it has taken the part of all the weak, the low, the botched. Basically, what he was saying is that Christianity is a crutch. How then would you feel if I said that I agree with the statement that Christianity is indeed a crutch, uh, that it is uh, for those who realize they can't make it on their own, who are at the end of their tether? Initially, I think some of you who are Christians this morning might be offended, but why? You see, people don't, in general, think that crutches are bad things. I mean, when you see someone on crutches, you don't immediately think, ugh, what a pathetic excuse of a human being. You don't, I hope, 
despise them and think, oh, there goes another retard. Indeed, I imagine quite the opposite happens. You have some sympathy for them. You might stop your car to let them cross the road or give up your seat for them on an overcrowded train or bus. Why then does a crutch become a bad thing when it's Christianity? I think the answer that most critics of this statement would give is this. If Christianity is a crutch, then it's only good for cripples. Because we don't like to see ourselves as cripples, it is offensive to our self-sufficiency to label Christianity as a crutch. Yet, what did, what did Jesus say in Mark's Gospel, and uh, chapter 2 and verse 17? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. In other words, the only people who will ever come to get what Jesus has to give are sick people, people who know they are spiritually and morally and very often physically crippled. Those who would take the statement that Christianity is a crutch and use it as an accusation against embracing the Christian faith are the same ones who would also argue that real joy and fulfillment in life are to be found in the pursuit of self-reliance, self-confidence, self-determination and self-esteem. What they fail to see, however, is that the religion of self-determination and self-reliance goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, who thought that Satan's temptation to become like God, i.e. to be self-reliant and self-determining, was more preferable than dependence upon God and obedience to his commands. If you are familiar with this story, you will know that thousands and thousands of years later, we are still living with the consequences of that ill-fated choice. Fear, guilt, shame, blame, broken relationships, and a separation from God. Look around you. We see these things played out daily. I am sure that uh, many of us have friends, neighbours, people we know who struggle with fear, who are very aware of brokenness. God's solution to all this was not that we look in, that we find ourselves, not that we work harder to be better people, but that actually we look to the cross where Jesus died. This one act of sacrificial love paved the way for humankind to be reconciled to God and to be set free from the grip of fear and guilt, shame and blame. It also paved the way for the divisions between human beings to be broken down and overcome. Listen, maybe some of this stuff is very real to you this morning. Maybe you in, in this pandemic are, are just struggling with fear, with anxiety, with uncertainty. Maybe you just live in a situation that is just a mess. It's broken. You don't know which way to turn. Maybe you just long for that joy and for that peace. Well, look, if that's you, I'd encourage you just to get in touch with us. You leave a message on our website. We have a phone here at church. Give us a ring, leave a message, and we will get back to you. Now, that's a long introduction, but I say all this as a backdrop to Jesus' opening words in the Sermon on the Mount. And so we read in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Listen again how Peterson, in his translation of the Bible, the message, he puts it. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. In other words, helplessness and not self-reliance or self-determination is, in the words of John Piper, a doorway to heaven. A doorway to the now blessings of the kingdom of God, i.e. hope, peace, joy, contentment. And also a doorway to the not yet blessings of the kingdom. A new heavens, a new earth, where there will be no more suffering, no more injustice or death. And where we will see and spend eternity with the one who laid down his life for us, Jesus Christ. Now, a story that for me perfectly illustrates what poverty of spirit looks like it's the parable Jesus tells of the Pharisee and the tax collector. We find that in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Picture the scene. 
try and imagine yourself watching the story as it is being played out. Two men from completely contrasting backgrounds. One is a Pharisee, a religious man, the other a tax collector. Now the Pharisee was a, a respectable and upright man, a man who no doubt would be known for his regular attendance at the temple, someone who would have prayed three times a day, a meticulous observer of God's law, a religious man who prided himself in being a descendant of Abraham. And here he is in his flowing gowns, his prayer shawl covering his head, speaking to God, doing what all good religious people did. Oh God, I thank you that I am not like these other miscreants, these cheats, these liars, these abusers, these wasters. I'm a good man, righteous in so many ways. I give, I fast and do so many other good works commanded in your law. The tax collector, well, a Jew, and therefore because he was a tax collector, someone despised and hated both by his own people and the Romans who occupied Israel at that time. He would have been guilty, no doubt, of lining his own pocket on occasions, robbing those who could barely afford what was demanded of them anyway. A sinner for sure, someone who clearly fell, well, fell way short of what God's law required. Someone who didn't fast and who certainly didn't give. And here he is, this miscreant, this thief, this chief, this waster at the temple, this holy place that housed God's presence, talking to God. Unable to even look up to God, all he could say was, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, before continuing with the story, let us remind ourselves of the context. Luke, in chapter 18 and verse 9 of this gospel, makes it clear that Jesus is speaking to those who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. Now, when Jesus, continuing with this story, goes on to say, I tell you that this man, this tax collector, this miscreant, Rather than the other man, the Pharisee, the respectable, upright, law observing good-working Jew, went home justified before God. You, we, need to know that this statement, this conclusion to the story, would have shocked his hearers to the core. Why? Well, because what Jesus was implying, and indeed was stating quite unequivocally, was that the kingdom of God is not for those who think they deserve it on merit, on the basis of their religious observances or their good works or their standing in the community, but it is for those who know they don't deserve it, who know that all they can look to and trust in is the grace and mercy of God. In other words, it's for those who are poor in spirit. It is for those who, as John Piper observes, have a sense of powerlessness in themselves, a sense of spiritual bankruptcy and helplessness before God, a sense of moral uncleanness before God, a sense of personal unworthiness before God, a sense that if there is to be any life or joy or usefulness, it will have to be all God and all of grace. And so as one hymn writer puts it, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. But to those who approach God in this way, who recognize that they are poor, helpless, bankrupt, there is a promise, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven or God, and a declaration, they are blessed. The word blessed here is from the Greek word makarios, literally translated happy. Happy not in the subjective sense of feeling happy, but in the objective sense that it is God who declares every follower of Jesus, who is poor in spirit, who mourns, who hungers and thirsts, to be happy, fortunate, well off. What then is this kingdom of heaven about which Jesus speaks? Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, it means, in its essence, Christ's rule or the sphere and realm in which he is reigning. As disciples, then, we belong to a different kingdom, to a different world. And so Paul writes to, to the Philippian church, 
but our citizenship is in heaven. This idea of belonging to a different kingdom sheds light on the words the Apostle Peter uh, writes when he states, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners. Greek word there, paroikos, those who live in a place that is not their home. And exiles, in other words, temporary residents, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Uh, listen to the message version of the same scripture. Friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego, ego at the expense of your soul. Live an exemplary life among the natives so that your actions will refute their prejudices. Then they'll be won over to God's side and be there to join in the celebration when he arrives. Kind of got me thinking about how you become a British citizen. When someone applies to become a citizen of this country, they need to meet certain requirements. Firstly, they must have spent at least five years of continuous residence in the UK. Secondly, they must have held indefinite leave to remain in the UK for at least 12 months. But then I noticed these other three requirements. They must meet the English language requirements. In other words, they must learn to speak the lingo. They must pass the life in the UK test to show that they are aware of the basics of the British customs, traditions and culture. In other words, they must come to understand the British way of life, how we live. And then lastly, they must demonstrate their good character. What then does this mean for us? Citizens now in a different country of a different kingdom. Well, I think firstly, as citizens of heaven, we also must learn to speak a different language, a different lingo. Not the language of lies and hypocrisy and slander and gossip and put-downs, which is the language of the world we left behind, but the language of encouragement and comfort and blessing. The language of the world to which we now belong, our citizens. The lingo of the kingdom of God. Secondly, as citizens of heaven, we must also come to understand how citizens of this kingdom are to live. As a first century Christian writer put it, followers of Jesus marry and have children like everyone else, but they do not kill unwanted babies. They share a common table, but not a common bed. They are present in the flesh, but they do not live according to the flesh. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are dishonoured and yet gain glory through dishonour. And finally, as citizens of heaven, we must demonstrate our good character. The character of the disciples that Jesus describes here in the Sermon on the Mount. Those who are poor in spirit, who mourn, who are meek, who hunger and thirst, who are pure in heart, who are peacemakers, who are persecuted because they demonstrate Christ-like character. This is the way of citizens of the kingdom of God. This is the way of followers of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, a whole pile of stuff to take in. And uh, I simply pray then that you help us to become people who move away from self-reliance, self-determination, the focus on self-esteem, and actually become those who just throw themselves upon you, who are utterly dependent upon you. And as a result of that, become those who live differently, who find fulfillment, contentment, a joy, a peace, because actually our bedrock is Christ and our love is Christ and we live for him. So fill us with your spirit this week. Send us out. Uh, be glorified in us and through us. We give you thanks for another week. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Your 
kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father in heaven, lead us not into temptation. God, do you live? Forgive us our sins as we forgive the one who have sinned against us. Our Father in heaven, lead us now into temptation. God, you Yours is the